So, welcome everybody to the Stimson Center. I'm Michael Craig I'm an analysis <coughs> guy and not a numbers guy. So I'm going to leave the numbers to these folks, who also happen to be really good at analysis. Uh, Samir's going to run the program. I just want to convene it and say one or two messages. First message is that we at Stimson really pride ourselves in being, in doing data-driven analysis. Uh, everybody has opinions in Washington, and we have opinions too, but we like to think that they are rooted in serious analytical work. And I hope you agree after you've read this report that this is data-driven analysis. The second thing I want to say before I leave, or sit down, is that we at Stimson also pride ourselves in um, the advancement, development of rising talent. Uh, we really care about uh, seeing younger analysts who come to us. Um, we love to see their intellectual talent. And Shane, is an example of this. And this report speaks well of Shane, and I think it also hopefully uh, speaks well of our commitment to rising talent. So with those few remarks, Samir, it's all yours. Okay. Now you're in my world. <laughs> <laughs> so I wanted to just give you a little sense of the order of operations today. I'll briefly introduce the panelists, and then we'll ask Shane to give a brief presentation on the report, which um, he'll try to summarize with sort of a very meaty and dense report and some of the key findings. And then we'll ask our two uh, discussants, Nilanti and Shuja, to offer some comments um, on the findings, as well as the, you know, the general sort of trend lines that we're seeing in the region. And we'll open up to a Q&A, uh, where all of you can engage and uh, challenge and provoke. Um, <coughs> hopefully in the form of questions, but we'll, we'll take it as it comes. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping rules. Uh, please turn off your cell phones. We don't want any interruptions while we're having uh, this discussion. Um, if you care to, well, I should say turn off the ringers on your cell phones. If you care to continue tweeting uh, this discussion, you can do so with the hashtag Stimson today. Uh, and there's some details on the, this uh, sheet that you have in front of you for how to get onto the wireless. Uh, so let me start by introducing our panelists from uh, left to right, <coughs> my left. Shuja Nawaz, who uh, many of you know uh, in this field, is a distinguished fellow at the Atlantic Council. Uh, he's worked with the Rand Corporation, the USIP, the Center for Strategic International Studies, uh, and other leading think tanks on projects dealing with Pakistan and the Middle East. He's advised and briefed senior government and military officials and parliamentarians in the United States, Europe, and Pakistan. Uh, interestingly enough, he was a reporter for many years in Pakistan, including covering the 1971 war. And most of you hopefully know him uh, by reading his seminal work Cross Swords, of which I hear there's going to be an update coming out in the spring. So you should all ask Shuja afterwards how that's coming along and uh, when we can, can expect um, sort of the next iteration of that. It's uh, one of the leading works on understanding Pakistani military and uh, Pakistan's conflicts um, and experience with war in the, in the, in, uh, historically. Um, to Shuja's right is Nilanti Samarnayaka, who's a strategic studies analyst at the Center for Naval Analyses. She focuses on South Asian Indian Ocean security uh, and was a project director of a major CNA study that was recently released, I think, yeah, uh, on water resource competition in the Brahmaputra River Basin, China, India, and Bangladesh, which I hear there's going to be a new talk on this coming up soon. Uh, certainly has become a, you know, back in the news uh, with sort of the discussion of the Indus Water Treaty in recent, um, recent weeks. Prior to CNA, uh, Nilanti was at the NBR, the National Bureau of Asian Research, uh, where she investigated Sri Lanka's deepening economic and politi political and military ties with China, 
uh, and her findings and research have been published in the Asian Security, World Politics Review, South Asia Journal, National Interest, Diplomat, Yale Global, yada, 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 overachiever. Uh, and previous to that, she was a, uh, a, a researcher at the Pew Research Center, uh, where she directed two quadrennial studies on America's place in the world. And then finally, to my right, is Shane Mason, uh, who's been a research associate with the South Asia program here at Stimson. Uh, and prior to that, he was a Scoville Fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, where he worked, on the, worked in the nuclear policy program. Uh, he's had a, a substantial experience of working in the Department of External Relations uh, at the Preparatory Commission for the CTBTO in Vienna. Uh, he studied Urdu in Lucknow, India, uh, and has done State, uh, State Department and Critical Language Fellowship. Uh, what you don't know and what's not on your sheet is that Shane used to be a professional golfer and part of the PGA Tour. And it's the reason he's always five minutes early, because five minutes early is the only way to be on time. Uh, and so for that, I expect that Shane's going to keep two time uh, in his presentation, and uh, we'll, we'll proceed with some discussion after that. Thank you very much. Thanks. Right, so thank you very uh, much, Samir, for that introduction. Um, and uh, uh, thanks to everyone for being here today. Um, uh, before I begin, I'd like to thank uh, Michael for convening the event, and Samir as well. Uh, for not only giving me the opportunity to write this report, but for their assistance uh, during the writing process. I'd also like to thank Nalanthi and Shuja for participating in the event today and for serving as discussants, and to my colleagues in the South Asia program who've had to endure some frenzied behavior in the last few weeks as I've been putting the finishing touches on this report. So I apologize, and it'll all be over soon. Uh, in the next 10 to 15 minutes, um, I'd like to outline three of the major arguments. I, that I advance in this report. First, that India enjoys defense spending advantages over, over Pakistan, and this advantage is likely to increase over time. But nevertheless, the effect of this advantage, the military of this effect, is less than one would expect, given the top-line defense spending figures. Next, the report argues that Pakistan almost certainly spends more on defense than its official budget documents indicate, and finally, that India spends at least 4% of its de uh, defense budget on nuclear weapon spending, and that Pakistan spends at least 10% of its defense budget on nuclear weapons. To conclude, I'm, I'd like to outline some of the strategic choices that I think India and Pakistan will face in the next decade or so with, re with respect to defense spending. So last year, India spent $50 billion on defense, making it the sixth largest defense budget in the world. This represents 9% of total government spending in India, and just over 2% of gross domestic product. Now, as we can see on this chart, India enjoyed a 5 to 1 defense spending advantage over Pakistan last year. Um, according to Pakistan's uh, government uh, documents, Pakistan last year spent just over $7 billion on defense. However, outside estimates place that figure closer to $9.3 billion, and uh, it's a 40% difference. And that later in the presentation, I'll get into why I think that difference exists. Uh, as it happens, so Pakistan uh, dedicates 3.4% of GDP to defense, and almost 20% of government spending. The first thing I'd like to argue is that um, the effect of India's advantage is not as great as one would expect, given the top line figures. And this is for two reasons. First, personnel costs and uh, military pensions since 2005 have been crowding out capital outlays, or uh, resources dedicated to military modernization. Unfortunately for India, I expect this trend to continue as the government has recently committed to increase military salaries and a new uh, pension scheme that will increase costs. The second factor is the Indian military services routinely underspend its budget allocations. Uh, a recent parliamentary report noted that this is particularly acute in capital allocations. So India under, the military services underspend their budget and then they divert that underspent money to non-essential or non-priority items. This underspending is a function of procurement delays, uh, India's slow defense bureaucracy, 
And as Kate Subramanian put it in 2005, a relatively ad, ad hoc approach to defense spending and defense budget management. And I think these have real world consequences. As we can see in this slide, over the last 10 years, India's relative advantage over Pakistan in terms of main battle tanks and artillery, self-propelled and towed artillery, has been declining. Um, when it comes to aircraft, uh, India's interest in purchasing Rafale aircraft from France has been diminished uh, and delayed for over a decade. And it's not just these big ticket systems uh, that India is having, India's having trouble with. It's more tactical systems as well. In a recent parliamentary report, a Ministry of Defense official noted that there are shortages in modern assault rifles, bulletproof vests, and even ammunition. So this is having real-world consequences. My second argument that I advance in the paper is that Pakistan almost certainly spends more on defense than its official budget documents indicate. First, Pakistan does not include military pension, pensions in its defense budget. Uh, Pakistan's Minister of Defense recently uh, uh, noted that this practice uh, began in the year 2000. I know uh, uh, Shuja and I uh, will have a, somewhat a disagreement about that, but happy to talk about it uh, during uh, the discussion. Um, but nevertheless, this certainly uh, artificially lowers Pakistan's defense budget by not including pensions. And second, there is some reason to suspect that some off-budget financing complements the defense budget. Um, first, the report raises questions about something called contingent liabilities, which the Ministry of Defense defines as possible future liabilities that will only become certain on the occurrence of some future event. It also acknowledges that this is used, that this fund is used as a cost reduction strategy by uh, minister, ministries in Pakistan's government, and that without taking this into account, it's impossible to gain a holistic view uh, of the budget. Contingent liabilities over the last few years have accounted for a quarter of Pakistan's federal government spending. And I think there's good reason to suspect that at least some of that goes to defense. The second point I'd like to mention um, is, the idea, is the subject of corporations with ties to the military and the either direct or indirect ways that they may contribute to the defense budget. In a recent parliamentary question and answer session, uh, the Defense Minister Asif in Pakistan uh, listed dozens of companies that have ties to the military. These companies are involved in seemingly every sector of the economy, from construction, real estates, uh, and even offshore liquid natural gas. Now, Pakistan is relatively opaque when it comes to defense spending. Um, and consequently, there are questions to be asked about these relationships and whether, once again, there's a direct or even an indirect relationship uh, on defense budgets. And the final point I'd make on, on this score is uh, what's, what we have on the slide here, and that's uh, Pakistan's defense budget is effectively higher than its official documents indicate uh, because of the impact of U.S. military assistance. Since 2002, the United States has provided over $22 billion in, in, in uh, overt security-related assistance to Pakistan. As this slide indicates, uh, uh, the average uh, contribution that this has made to the defense budget has been right around 20%. It's been declining in recent years, but the average over this time period. Um, and the security assistance has come in the form of for, uh, foreign military financing, coalition support fund reimbursements, and other types of programs. Um, and I under understand there's an argument to be made that coalition support funds shouldn't be included because technically it's a reimbursement, uh, but I think for the purposes of the presentation and the report, it's good to note uh, the upper bound of our contributions. And in addition, uh, of course, there is presumably uh, covert assistance that the United States is providing, which of course in the open source we have um, no access to. And so finally, I would like to discuss nuclear weapons. And I'd like to outline my, fun, my, my estimates of nuclear weapons spending in India and Pakistan and describe it in a, a little bit of detail the methodology that I use. And before I begin, I'd like to say that both in my remarks and in the reports, uh, I use uh, a, a lot of caveats. Um, this is uh, a very difficult analytical challenge. We have very little data. Uh, but I think what this section of the report does is move the ball down the fields and uh, provide important data uh, for future researchers to use as kind of a baseline estimate of nuclear weapons spending. Um, 
In India, I developed an estimate based on data released uh, from parliamentary reports. Uh, the report, which came out last year, uh, details uh, the annual budget of the Defense Research and Development Organization, um, with the DRDO. Uh, this is uh, one of the key stakeholders in India's nuclear program and is responsible for developing the nuclear-capable ballistic and cruise missiles in India's arsenal. He further noted that 46% of DRDO's budget goes to strategic systems. So with this information, how do I get from here to the full nuclear weapons budget? Because certainly nuclear spending includes a lot more than simply missiles. Uh, in order to try to get some insight on this, uh, I found a, a report from the CBO, uh, the Congressional Budget Office, that noted that 50% of the US nuclear spending is dedicated to strategic delivery systems. Um, and for better or for worse, I made the assumption for the purposes of this estimate that India uh, has something that has a similar arrangement, that half of India's nuclear weapons budget is dedicated to uh, strategic delivery systems. So I therefore doubled 46% of DRDO's strategic budget for the full nuclear weapons budget in these last five years. As we can see in this year, I estimate that India will spend close to $2 billion on nuclear weapons, and that this accounts for somewhere between 4 and 5% of the defense budget. For Pakistan, uh, I use a simpler methodology. And Pakistan is probably even a more difficult analytical challenge to estimate their nuclear weapons spending because there's so little information. Um, but here I also based my estimate uh, on a data point that I found in a parliamentary report. Um, in April of this year, uh, the Senate Defense Committee released a report detailing a mid-year review of the defense budget. And uh, there was certainly uh, a delightful and uh, curious surprise uh, in this report. Not only did the report uh, lay out information from the Ministry of Defense that detailed spending for the Army, the Navy, and the Air Force, but it also included the, but the uh, stated budget of the SPD, the Strategic Plans Division. The Strategic Plans Division is the premier institution in Pakistan's nuclear weapons program and serves as a secretariat for the country's nuclear uh, national command authority, the command and control structure. Previous open source estimates have essentially tried to uh, estimate all the different organizations in Pakistan's nuclear program, add them together, and that uh, was their estimate for nuclear weapon spending. And all the estimates came between uh, $700 million uh, and about $2 billion, the high end. Um, so for this year, uh, this report notes that 78 billion rupees, uh, or 10% of the defense budget, was dedicated to the SPD. So in the report, I essentially argue that that should be the baseline for our understanding of nuclear spending in Pakistan. There's a lot more data to be uh, discovered, and I think there's a lot more, this raises a lot more questions than answers. Um, but I think it's a useful starting point for future research. Um, and so here's a slide that uh, estimates uh, Pakistan's nuclear weapons budget for the last uh, five or six years. Um, so right around $750 million this year, um, and 10% of the spent defense spending in all the years previously. Um, to conclude, I'd, I'd love to uh, highlight what I think are some of the uh, strategic challenges that each country faces with respect to defense spending in the next decade. I believe that India's challenge is to translate high economic growth rates into military power which you can't do if an increasing share of its defense budget is dedicated to pensions uh, and personnel costs at the expense of capital expenditures. And this isn't a problem that's unique to India. The United States, for example, really is trying to rein in uh, costs related to personnel costs and pensions. This is something that every military faces. Um, but I think for India to realize its full military aspirations, this is something that it needs to keep in check. And nor can India realize its full potential if it's underspending defense allocations. Uh, it seems self-evident, but it, it's a definite challenge. Um, reform of the defense 
uh, bureaucracy is extremely difficult in India. I think it'll require top-down leadership, uh, political leadership, to do so. And unfortunately for India, uh, reforms in the defense uh, bureaucracy have been difficult to come by. And I think Pakistan's strategic challenge uh, is very different, and I think in some ways it is encapsulated um, in this slide. India currently enjoys roughly a five to one defense spending advantage over Pakistan, but it's almost certain to grow over time. Not only is India's economy much larger than Pakistan's, but it's growing faster. It's the fastest growing large economy in the world. Um, I have two uh, estimates uh, for uh, the defense spending uh, balance or ratio in 2030. One economic forecast uh, from PricewaterhouseCooper uh, in 2030, and essentially I held uh, the defense spending as a percentage of GDP constant from this year until 2030. So under uh, this estimate, uh, India's uh, advantage will grow from five to one to six to one. Um, seemingly not much, but certainly substantial if you're sitting in Rawalpindi. Uh, a more bullish for economic forecast for India um, in 2030 comes from uh, the US government, actually the USDA. And by that calculation, uh, India will enjoy a 10 or 11 to one uh, defense spending advantage. Now, um, what I think is important here is that the nature of this challenge is not new for Pakistan. Pakistan has always been under-resourced compared to India. But I think the scale of this challenge, if these forecasts turn out to be true, will be unprecedented. And so I think the question for Pakistan is what to do about this. What is Pakistan, what strategies are they going to develop to cope in a security environment in which their perceived adversary spends 11 times more, 10 times more on defense than they, than they do? In the, in the past, Pakistan has been able to invest in both conventional and nuclear capabilities. The military secured a large portion of the federal budget for defense, and it has for the last 15 years received support from uh, the United States. Um, but as this slide indicates, and I think all of us in Washington uh, can safely assume that this support from the United States uh, will not continue in perpetuity, and in fact, it's definitely declining. I think because of this, Pakistan will have to make tough choices about what to invest in conventional nuclear capabilities involved in counterinsurgency. I think perhaps China will step in to fill the void, uh, but I suspect that it probably won't be able to pick up all the slack. And so these are really important questions for uh, Pakistani defense planners. Throughout its history, Pakistan has developed strategies to compete with India, an, an adversary, perceived adversary, that is much better resource. It has sought assistance from great powers like the United States, that utilized non-state actors, and developed a robust nuclear weapons program. Although the strategy hasn't effectively imposed costs on India, um, it has diminished Pakistan's international reputation and position, while weakening its social cohesion and diminishing prospects for economic growth. Based on my analysis, I believe that Pakistan will invest, invest more in nuclear weapons as the conventional balance with India, or the conventional balance of the region inexorably favors India. India's defense spending advantage will stoke Pakistan's worst case perceptions of the regional balance, and Pakistan will almost certainly double down on nuclear deterrence. Pakistan has already signaled an interest in a larger nuclear arsenal with a fourth, by building a fourth plutonium production reactor, and statements from senior uh, Pakistani officials uh, indicating that a sea-based nuclear deterrent is in the works. So I think the choice between investments in conventional and nuclear capabilities will be key for Pakistan going forward into the next decade. If it invests in nuclear weapons at the, at the expense of conventional capabilities, however, I think this will be detrimental to Pakistan's national security uh, and to the security of others as well. So thank you very much. Thank you. So Shuja, can I ask you to offer some comments and feedback. Certainly. Thank you very much for inviting me, and thanks also for having shown me an earlier draft so that I could make some suggestions, some of which um, Shane took into account, and others, as he indicated, we disagree. So uh, let me begin by saying that uh, no country spends on defense without having a clear vision of why it's doing that. I think it's very critical for us to try and understand the why. 
for both these countries. Uh, India is, uh, particularly in the last couple of decades, uh, has, uh, is no longer simply caught up in a rivalry with Pakistan. India is now an emerging economic and, and regional superpower. And um, India's strategy and vision for its defense posture is uh, obviously looking at Pakistan a lot, as almost any Indian analysis will indicate, despite the relative sizes of the militaries or the perceived threats. Um, but India does have uh, a vision of its role as an Indian Ocean power, um, which will be able to project its uh, power and its influence in the Indian Ocean along the littoral states of the Indian Ocean. And it wants to be able to protect trade routes from the Malacca Straits down to the Cape of Good Hope. Uh, some of this actually uh, I, I discovered from reading uh, some papers that were produced even in the mid 80s, which is when my own interest in defense spending uh, really began when I was at the IMF. And uh, that brings me up to the second point, which is a factual point on pensions. Uh, both India and Pakistan are duty bound as members of the International Monetary Fund to report uh, their spending to the IMF, to the, the government finance statistics. And uh, we discovered uh, that the IMF data was missing um, data from India at one point uh, on pensions. They had decided to move it to one side, away from the defense budget. Um, so that uh, the IMF wouldn't complain about the fact that they were spending too much on defense. This was at a time when India was still among borrowing countries at the moment. Uh, a couple of years after that, the Pakistanis discovered this to be the case, and they, they followed suit. <laughs> so in the mid-80s, both countries basically decided that they would not report their pensions, which, as Shane points out, is a fairly substantial proportion. In fact, uh, in this year's budget for India, I think uh, if you remove the increase in pensions, the actual increase in the total defense budget of India for the rail stuff is only about 1 or 2 percent. So um, they're already getting short shrift. And that's the reality of demographics, that as people uh, live longer, uh, they get pensions for a much longer time. They also need medical assistance when they're retirees, and so that's really where, where the expenditures increase. In Pakistan, they have created the Army Welfare Trust and the Forgy Foundation, which allegedly uh, provides the wherewithal uh, for looking after a lot of the veterans. I don't know how efficient they are in making profits. Um, many of the reports coming out of the Public Accounts Committee of, of Parliament point to the inability to generate profits and actually seek subsidies from the government. But the case in theory, the aim is to provide support to ex-service. Uh, so this is a reality that both India and Pakistan will face, as will the militaries uh, across the globe, or even civilian institutions, because pensioners are going to live longer, and they will demand services. And um, these are commitments that uh, have to be respected. Um, now, what is Pakistan's vision? Pakistan's vision has always been India-centric, except in recent years. And I think that this is something that one has to recognize. Pakistan today faces a much more immediate threat, which is internal. The Pakistan army has had uh, close to 200,000 of its troops that were primarily oriented to facing India in a war or physically facing India uh, with formations along the eastern border that were moved to, uh, to the west and have been fighting in Fatah uh, or are deployed in Balochistan now. So uh, their focus is going to be shifting, has shifted entirely, uh, away from, from India. So on, on paper, you have the same formations looking at India, but in reality, they are cannibalized and, and they've been rotated in and out of Fatah. I think this situation is not going to change for Pakistan. And that's a reality that has to be taken into account. The other reality is that in India, where there are also insurgencies and internal problems, the military is not the first line of defense. It's the civilian 
forces, it is the police uh, that is the first line of defense. And except in Kashmir, where there's a sizable military presence, everywhere else uh, you have the civilian forces taking that on. Whereas in Pakistan, we've discovered because of the ill preparedness and the ineptitude of, of civilian institutions, uh, the military has been outsourced this activity. So counter militancy, counter insurgency, uh, whether it's Karachi, whether it's, it's uh, Punjab, uh, whether it's Fatah or Balochistan, uh, the military is now the front line for this. I do have an issue uh, when one looks at uh, the overall statistics. And the issue I think Shane recognizes is the one of US transfers. Um, CSF uh, should never be seen as assistance. CSF, I've contended from the outset was a bad deal for Pakistan, should never have been agreed to by the government of Pakistan, by President Musharraf. It was based on some very poor assumptions uh, which uh, assumed that there would be a very short conflict for a year or two, and that at the marginal cost of moving troops to Fatah and to the border, Pakistan should ask for whatever they could quickly agree to. And they didn't even do back of the envelope calculations. I think these were just hastily put together numbers. And they agreed to getting reimbursement. And then they got caught in this cycle of over uh, asking and then being reduced. And then they had budget shortfalls as a result every year. Because the Ministry of Finance would say, we are expecting 2 billion, and they would get 1.2 or 1 billion or less. Um, for the US to maintain that this is a system, I think, is uh, not correct. For anyone else to maintain that this is a system is not correct. Because the real cost of this conflict for Pakistan, for the military, and for the population and for the economy has been much, much greater. Whether it's the loss of infrastructure, damage to equipment, uh, just wear and tear of equipment and then morale uh, because you're rotating people two or three times in and out. Uh, and then there was no, no calculation for what would cover those costs. So CSF, I think, has been a kind of a bogus issue. Um, and it's about time that this was laid to rest uh, because as soon as the U.S. kinetic operations end, they're going to have to rename it in any case. Um, The other point is on the economic growth rates. And I think this is something um, that should be a serious concern to both India and Pakistan, but more to Pakistan than to India, because India is a much larger economy. And India looks at China as a rival. It looks at China as an economic rival as well as a military rival. Um, but if you look at the uh, order of battle of Indian forces, and particularly the land forces uh, and the air force, it is primarily arrayed against the eastern border of Pakistan. So there's a disconnect there. Uh, India had promised uh, itself that it would raise a, a mountain core uh, for the northeast, uh, but that apparently has now been shelved. Um, they could easily have, and as this has been suggested, among others, uh, by Bharat Kavnad, who is not exactly uh, beloved by, by Pakistan because he was the author of the Sialkot grab plan. Um, Bharat Karnak suggested, why not move one of the strike corps away from the border and, and you would have a very positive sig signaling effect on Pakistan that India doesn't plan to invade Pakistan. Uh, that remains an abiding concern on the, uh, on the Pakistani side. But to reduce that, if you move the core to the Chinese border, then you achieve uh, whatever balance you, you want to achieve over there. There has really been no discussion of India's strategic vision. And in parallel, there's been no discussion, public discussion, of Pakistan's strategic vision. Uh, both sides inherited the British method of doing things. And there is something called a war directive, which the government, the civilian government, is supposed to issue to the military. And then the military comes up with a doctrine, starting with the services and then at the joint headquarters level. Um, the war directive in Pakistan has never been updated. When Musharraf was told uh, by his generals, we need to think about it and get the government to give us a new war directive, 
so we know where we're headed. Um, he said, oh, I know what we want, so we don't really have to worry about it. Because he was the army chief and he was the president. Uh, successive civilian governments have shied away from it, so we had this very curious situation uh, about three years ago, actually in 2012, that the army on its own came up with the army doctrine. And there was no equivalent Air Force doctrine or Navy doctrine that I'm aware of. And there was nothing pulling it together based on which the civilian government could then say, we'd like you to go back and redo this because this is our order for you. This is what we want you guys to be thinking about. So none of that discussion has taken place. In India, all this is really kept within close to the chest of the, uh, uh, the, the babus uh, in the ministries. And uh, if anything, uh, if Pakistan has an ally in India, it is the bureaucracy in the Indian Ministry of Defense. Because if it weren't for that bureaucracy, India would have had a much more efficient military, much more advanced, they wouldn't be in the dire strait that they are in terms of aircraft that are serviceable. They wouldn't be in the dire strait that they are in terms of, of the, the military equipment, the battle tanks, um, et cetera, et cetera. So that uh, all the talk of the Cold Start and the independent battle groups, they would have been much more effective um, and a much greater threat to Pakistan. Now, having said all that, uh, I, I I'm very grateful that Shane has done this work uh, because, as he put it, I think this should spark more research uh, and should spark efforts within the countries to try and get more data out. And if anything good is to emerge from this, I hope that parliaments in both countries would take it upon themselves to ask questions and try and get answers, not just on the shape of things, but how are things acquired? and to address the issue of corruption, which is rampant on both sides of the border, and which is a huge drain on the defense expenditures of both countries. Because uh, enormous proportions of monies that are spent, particularly in acquiring weapons systems from overseas, and then in producing them domestically also, because now domestic industries are being set up, are riddled with corruption, and there is no sunlight. Until parliaments get in on the act, until the military itself decides on both sides of the border that it is in their interest to get the biggest bang for the buck, uh, they'll continue to make mistakes, acquiring bad technologies, bogus technologies in some cases, like the bomb detection warrants that Pakistan and India both acquired that don't work. Uh, and and uh, this will be a burden on, on them, and it will be a burden on their economies. The answer for both countries in the end is political. If they can resolve their differences, if they can go back to rebuilding their economies uh, and providing for jobs for the youth that are growing, uh, they will have done much more to enhance their defense than acquisition of, of arms and armaments. Thank you. Thank you, Shuja. Come on. Uh, thanks. Good afternoon. And uh, I'd like to thank Samir and the Stimson Center for the invitation to be here today. I was asked to discuss the strengths and the weaknesses of the report, as well as challenge any assumptions or particular arguments. Overall, I think Shane's report is an important contribution and a timely one. Especially, it will help us understand this long-running conflict in South Asia that keeps taking twists and turns well into a new century. So first, by examining the military budgets of India and Pakistan, I think this report will be an important reference to have on the shelf and to keep consulting as we see news about the military modernization efforts in both countries. Second, I found its discussion of Pakistan to be quite sobering and an important reminder that for those of us who work in the India space and look east in the PACOM area of responsibility, just how much Pakistan will continue to loom large as a threat perception to Delhi policymakers and military planners, despite the pronouncements about India's eastward ambitions. 
Third, I appreciated the wealth of data in the paper, especially the use of graphics to highlight this data. And it occurred to me while reading your uh, report, Shane, that uh, if you want to build on this research, maybe turn it into an academic journal article, that you might want to uh, carve out a separate methodology section that systematically lists all of the data sets that you used. Because I, I was quite taken with all of the data referenced throughout the report, and I thought it might be helpful to list the data sets and the data challenges associated with each data set, and perhaps some of the comparative advantages that might exist for using some data sets over others. I just think it would be a, a useful resource for analysts going forward, especially since this is such a data-driven report. Also, the report is really well written, and I think that's no small feat for those of us who every day wade through lots of literature that comes out about the region. Uh, so that, that, I think, is uh, much appreciated. Next, the only assumption I would challenge is some of the discussion about South Asia and references to this term. I think it's worth pointing out that there's more to the South Asian security environment than the India-Pakistan conflict. As you know, the countries that border India, they've had very checkered histories and interactions with Delhi, uh, as well as subnational challenges with neighboring states in India. So these have also affected the security environment in South Asia, as have China's relationships with the smaller countries of South Asia. So if you're looking at the nuclear dimension, then for sure, India and Pakistan are the players. And I think that's a disclaimer that can be mentioned at the top or perhaps in a method statement. But this is just a minor point about framing the discussion. Finally, I have some questions that occurred to me as a result of reading the report, and they may be useful as you continue with this line of research. I'd be curious to hear more analysis about the implications of some of these trends in defense spending, uh, as well as any recommendations for Indian and Pakistani policymakers, as well as Washington policymakers, if that's relevant. Are there incentives to better behavior or disincentives? There is important discussion about the need to secure platforms and uh, some of the, the nuclear weapons that are carried on those platforms. Uh, or uh, positive incentives. The report rightly mentions the low level of funding given to the Pakistan Navy, uh, but this service is actually a, a vital contributor of maritime security in the region through its participation in combined maritime forces. The Pakistan Navy alone has commanded the Counter Piracy Task Force seven times and the Counter Terrorism Task Force nine times. And Pakistani Navy officers, they make it clear just how de highly dependent their country is on maritime trade and the need to protect against shipping attacks. So are there positive incentives to encouraging the, the budgets that go toward this service? Uh, especially just given the, the clear contributions to marit regional maritime security to multiple stakeholders. Third, are there some wild cards that may affect some of these trends in defense spending? Uh, I was trying to think of some potential futures, uh, perhaps an accident, and the embarrassment or the shame that would result uh, due to such an incident. So just trying to think about potential wild cards. And then fourth, I was curious about some of India's threat perceptions with regard to China, and Shuja mentioned this uh, in his remarks, um, how that factors into military planners' requests for budgets and the impact for military spending on India's threat perceptions with regard to Pakistan versus China. Um, the data for this may be hard to ascertain, um, and, and Shane's report talks about standing up the Mountain Corps. Um, but I think this is uh, important to get a sense about the proportion for these two threats, and especially how that would play out across the services. The outlook on the shipbuilding budget for the Indian Navy, it seems to be dropping. I found that a really interesting finding. It's a real point of pride for Indian Navy officers about how uh, all their, their platforms, they're being indigenously built. So does this suggest worse things to come? Uh, it's been a talking point for chiefs of naval staff how India is transitioning from a buyer's navy to a builder's navy. 
And there's a tantalizing mention at the end of the report about Pakistan's reliance on Russia and how that may increase. Uh, so I was just curious to hear more thoughts about this. Just uh, obviously this is a concern for India, and India signed uh, recent defense deals with Russia. So I think this would just be uh, an interesting uh, analysis to undertake just to look at what potential scenarios and uh, futures and second order effects uh, may, may occur uh, as a result of this Russia uh, dimension. And then finally, I, I found the analysis about rising personnel costs in India particularly interesting. Immediately, I thought about the US military, uh, as Shane mentioned in his op opening remarks about uh, the, the costs of personnel in that countries in the US's budget. Um, so I was thinking that could be an interesting case study that could be performed, uh, if not um, on the US, maybe on a middle power like Australia, where data may be available. Uh, just to see trends in proportion of defense spending uh, over time going toward personnel costs. And how India would fare in that. Is, is India's rate, is it, is it too high? Or maybe it's actually not so bad relative to countries of similar size and military capabilities. And whatever the findings, what would be the implications for Indian policymakers with regard to those trends? And I'll, I'll stop there. Great. Thank you guys. Thank you both for uh, the comments. Before we open it for Q&A, Shane, do you want to take a couple minutes to quickly just pick up on some points that were discussed? Or? Sure. sure. Just, just a few points. Um, and I'll ask you to thanks again for those comments. Those are um, uh, extremely helpful, and I'll definitely be taking those forward. Um, so I think kind of a conceptual uh, uh, point that both of you mentioned was um, thinking not only just about India and Pakistan. Uh, thinking about South Asia uh, security, including the other countries in South Asia, uh, Sri Lanka, Nepal, you know, Bangladesh, etc. And that's certainly a, a point taken. Um, I think uh, at least uh, the way I was thinking about it, that isolating India and Pakistan on this score uh, would make things easier for the analysis. And that bringing in those other factors would have just been above my pay grade. Um, Can I just add Afghanistan to that calculation? Because for purposes of security, Iran and Afghanistan now become part of the South Asia calculus mm -hmm. also. That, I think that's a, that's a great point there. But then uh, the other country that, that, that both um, discussants mentioned was China. Uh, and I think uh, the, the same um, uh, explanation kind of obtains there that, uh, that uh, from an analytical perspective, adding China would have been tough, and especially to capture it in as much detail. And uh, perhaps more self-interestedly, uh, including China would make a good sequel, so uh, perhaps uh, I can go from there. Um, uh, Shuja, you mentioned uh, economic growth, and I think that's a point well taken. Um, I think uh, looking at uh, GDP per capita, uh, for example, may have been more instructive. Um, and it, again, if we look at China, uh, China's GDP per capita is, I think, roughly $8,000 uh, a year. Uh, both India and Pakistan are right around the $2,000 mark. So I think that's an instructive data point as far as thinking about uh, balances of power in the region, or economic power. Definitely a point we'll take on methodology. I think uh, uh, Samir and I will definitely be working on that going forward as far as doing that. But I, I tried my best to lay out where the resources came from and uh, as much as I could. Um, Shuja, you mentioned coalition support funds. Uh, I've had uh, debate, I've been scolded about this before, and it's a point well taken. Um, and uh, I, I think it's, it's worthy of further debate as well, but um, I, I certainly take your point that technically these are reimbursements um, uh, for activities that Pakistan would not have otherwise taken. But I, I think there's a debate about that definition of whether those actions are actually actions that Pakistan wouldn't have taken otherwise without U.S. incentives or encouragement. And then Alanthi, the, the last one, the, the Russia uh, uh, note. Um, I was finishing this up for the last several weeks and I was almost upset that Russia did this because, like, man, now I have to think about Russia getting involved with Pakistan. Um, but I think, that, again, very tantalizing indeed, and hopefully I can work on that in the future. I think so. Great. Uh, I just want to say a couple more points about the report that were sort of drawn out in this discussion. But, you know, this is really sort of a testament to what you can do with open source data, unearthing new sources and drawing inferences from it. And obviously, Shane has pointed out that it's bounded by, you know, what we don't know that's not sort of publicly available, but still for. The amount that he was able to generate, uh, I, I thought was very impressive. The other thing that um, Nalanthi sort of pointed out is that, you know, Shane's report relies a lot on primary sources. And I think if you go through, the reason we put footnotes rather than endnotes is to sort of underscore the fact that 
a lot of these are coming from budget documents produced by parliaments in India and Pakistan and from finance ministries in both countries. So they're going to the primary original sources rather than uh, secondary sources that are um, uh, derivative in some way. Okay, so I want to open up the Q&A um, and uh, some questions in the mix. So we'll start, uh, let's go start from the very left and then we'll just rotate around the room. Hi, I'm Gino Hong from the Yahoo Institute. Uh, my question is, as you mentioned, uh, as Pakistan increases its nuclear capabilities to balance India, what about the, uh, how are they going to address the concern about the internal threats, those organizations that want to you know, try to get those uh, nuclear weapons? Why don't we, yeah, we can take a few, that's a good idea. Why don't we, sir, you had a question as well. Hi, John Sandoz from the Navy staff. Uh, quite, Nilanthi mentioned uh, the importance of, of informing the policies and how this kind of analysis can, can help inform policy development. I'd like to hear from both of you about uh, your assessment of how sensitive the Indian and Pakistani governments are to uh, this type of analysis done by U.S. think tanks. All right, I'll take a third real quick. Uh, hi, I'm Suf Hilagari with uh, uh, Sindhi Foundation. <coughs> I want to know that uh, the, uh, maybe Shujar, you know that the Pakistan is almost a jihadization society and the growth of the uh, madrasas and jihadis and the terrorism. I want to know that how much Pakistan is spending the military budget to counter these jihadis and also the how much the Pakistan military budget is uh, spending in Balochistan, the situation which is also a big risk for the Pakistan. Uh, I want to know about that. Okay, so we've got three questions. Why don't we uh, start with Shane and we'll just go down the line and you know, any thoughts. Um, so I'll, I'll definitely take a stab at the, the question from uh, the gentleman from the Assam Institute. Um, I, I think uh, the uh, dilemma uh, or the choice between um, conventional weapon systems, nuclear weapon systems, and capabilities that are uh, conducive for uh, internal threats, uh, counterterrorism and counterinsurgency, is perhaps the key question that Pakistan um, has to answer. Um, I think that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I think for a while it's been able to invest uh, in uh, particularly nuclear and conventional systems. It's difficult to identify with the amount of transparency <clears throat> or lack thereof um, that Pakistan has uh, with respect to defense budgets, exactly where and what types of systems uh, that they're um, investing in, um, in what regions uh, they're deploying in. So it's difficult to do so. Um, but I think if you're looking at it more from a big picture perspective, uh, then I think this choice, um, there are ways to, uh, data points that should be emerging that uh, we should find out um, what decisions they're making. Sure. Um, to answer uh, John's question about sensitivity of analysis being done, um, I mean, I think India, th there are just so many more people working on India and assessments of Indian security that I, I think policymakers, I imagine they're, they're more comfortable with it now because it's just become such a, uh, a recurring activity among U.S. think tanks, uh, you know, Stimson uh, Center obviously has a great program on South Asia, uh, lots of think tanks in the United States, so I think they're just, um, th they're more used to it now, and also I think uh, the government is a little bit uh, more favorably predisposed toward some of those organizations, uh, you know, operating in India, and we've seen uh, other U.S. think tanks setting up offices in India as well. Uh, their uh, Indian site uh, for some of the DC-based think tanks. So I think overall for India, it's, uh, they're, they're, they're more comfortable with it. So it is, so it is influencing policy there, do you think? I think it is, yeah. I mean, I, I think, you know, in the U.S., if a government official sees a, a report, it's, it's obviously going to be of interest if that's a portfolio that you're working on. I think the weak spot in this, I just want to pick up on what Vilanti was saying, the weak spot in this is something that um, is evident when you talk to people uh, in both India and Pakistan and the bureaucracy. They don't have the expertise in looking at defense systems. Uh, the civil services are designed in a way where people rotate in and out of 
the defense ministries, the Ministry of the Defense Production, and so on. They're looking for the next job, uh, a promotion. Uh, they don't have the same expertise that civilians have, say, who work in the Pentagon, or in and around the Pentagon, over time. Uh, and secondly, <laughs> uh, budgeting is not seen as a management tool. Budgeting is seen as a, a highly unnecessary evil that somebody else will do for them. And, you know, and, and therefore, it's a fictional exercise. Uh, and so as a result, uh, on both sides of the border, it's very difficult to get good data from inside the system. And this is why I say that I think it's incumbent on not just the government, but on parliament to step in and, and demand answers. Because they're losing money as a result. By, by the cost of delay in purchasing, um, the cost of not living up to a contract when you agreed to buy X hundred aircraft or an aircraft carrier or submarines or whatever, those are all going to add up, and they do add up. And so both countries suffer as a result of this. Uh, now, there's a very specific question on the exact amount being spent in Balochistan. Um, there is no breakdown available on, by, you know, for the army, particularly on, by, by core. But you know, uh, the 12 core was set up after the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. Otherwise, previously, there was no core there. And whatever brigade was posted in Quetta, was, uh, as was evident in 65, was used in the run of Kutch. Uh, so uh, th th there is an army corps there. There is the Frontier Corps, Balochistan. Um, but the, if, you, if you look at newspaper accounts, uh, you can actually put together the supplemental budget requests that are produced. And they, every now and then, do come out. And you can actually try and calculate what the original army budget was. And I think Shane has done a good job of trying to see where the difference is. But he's, he's made a very useful point, which none of you has raised, which is that the Pakistan uh, defense budget always overspends, and the Indian defense budget always underspends. Uh, and the reason why the Pakistan in, in recent years have been overspending is that it's a very reactive approach. And so as new threats emerge and grow, uh, so IS, for instance, or the move to, to working in Sindh and in Karachi and now in southern Punjab, uh, the expenditures are going to grow considerably uh, for the military as they take on policing duties um, uh, or as they take on more uh, expenses in safeguarding facilities. So after this attack uh, in Quetta on the police training academy, you can bet that within the next week, requests are going to come in for fortification and additional hiring of guards and so on for all such facilities. And this will, this will feed into the increase in the defense budget. Can I add a couple points? Sure, go ahead. Um, so on Shuja's point about uh, the Pakistan army overspending and the uh, Indian uh, military underspending its budget allocations, that's exactly right. So in, in fact, um, even within the Pakistani uh, military, the army does this more than the other services. So uh, Pakistan has only released uh, somewhat comprehensive documents since 2009. And in every single budget, the Pakistan army has overspent what it was originally allocated. The other services, not every time, but there is kind of a mixture. And in India, it's almost exactly the opposite. Um, uh, I also wanted to, to respond to the question about kind of the state, um, you know, the state of budget analysis in both India and Pakistan, um, and budget analysis here on uh, India and Pakistan's uh, defense budget. Um, I think one of the exciting things uh, about writing this report was um, there's been uh, you know a tremendous amount of literature on security issues in South Asia. Um, a lot of the topics deal with the Pakistan Army strategic culture, different worldviews, different non-state actors, uh, but very little has been written about military budgets. I think one reason is that military budgets are very dense and, and frankly kind of boring for most people. Um, so it's hard to get people to, to start. Not for shame. Not for me. <laughs> oh, no. um, and second, there's been kind of a lack of, of raw data. Again, up until recently, there wasn't much information. Um, so in India, there are, are a handful of analysts that well, work on defense budget issues, uh, and I hope that they'll be reading this very soon. Um, in Pakistan, it's, there's less of uh, a visibility on this issue. Um, what I would note is that uh, Halal, the, uh, the magazine that the 
uh, Pakistani military releases on, I believe, a monthly basis. Inevitably, in June of each year, which is the year that the budget is released, uh, we'll write a brief article about uh, myths about the defense budget, and it will anticipate arguments, some of them I'm making today, uh, about the Pakistan defense budget. And that's, that's frankly it uh, when it comes to defense budget analysis. So I hope at the very least it, it kind of this starts a, some what of a conversation. Yeah. So when we go on this end, then we'll rotate around. So, sir, we'll start with you. Well, my name is Daniel Yoon. Uh, I work with the Addison Analytics uh, for Defense Industry Consultancy, and uh, I'm the, uh, the South Asia uh, analyst. Um, my question to you is, uh, in, in the number of years that I've looked at the Indian defense budget, um, uh, I'm aware, uh, as um, uh, Dr. Nawaz, you brought up, um, all these off-budget sources of uh, military funding in India as well, too. Um, uh, and I want to tie that in with a, a question about um, your, your figures for um, the chain um, for uh, India's nuclear program spending. Um, half of it, you said, you said about, about half of India's um, anticipated uh, nuclear spending comes from the DRDO. That's, that's, that's traceable and, and, and by an anchor point. Um, but you don't, you don't mention where the other half might come from. Now, from, from my research, you know, I've seen that um, uh, the Indians are, are putting in um, quite a bit of money um, uh, from the office of the Prime Minister directly or some slush fund out there that uh, just, um, you know, it, it, uh, we know that that fund exists. We just have no clue where to trace it back or, or how much it is. I'm wondering if you have any insight into that. There's a broader question, you know, where, where the, the other half of the nuclear spending not come from the DRDO, where could that possibly be coming from? Okay, so PMO's slush fund. And uh, we also should point out that, I mean, while Shane was accounting for uh, the uh, the military formally, I mean, there's a huge million man paramilitary force in India that does do counterinsurgency operations, not just in Kashmir, but also in the northeast and uh, the central India and, and Punjab. And so uh, that's so we're probably underestimating defense spending in other ways as well. Why don't we add a couple more questions, and then we'll we'll get to that. So, sir, uh, I'm Ali, the Air Vice at the Embassy of Pakistan, and uh, I have two comments, and those pertain to the assumptions of this report, and then uh, finally, obviously, a question. And the first exception that uh, Pakistan wants to compete in India, uh, I think there's no desire in Pakistan to compete in uh, whether uh, it's in terms of economics, in terms of population, in terms of area. And as you point out, six to seven uh, ratio one defense spending, there's no desire for Pakistan to compete with India. The only requirement is to have credible deterrence. So this is uh, point number one. And the second uh, the exemption, that $19 billion in terms of funding by US is a huge thing. So just to clarify, uh, Pakistan uh, has probably sent over $120 billion over the last 15 years since Pakistan has been a part of war on terror and lost over 55,000, I would repeat 55,000 people, including a lot of military. So that is your second uh, assumption. And then the, my question, because the, uh, this report says the last part is risks. What are actually the risks? Uh, can you please elaborate upon uh, in detail what kind of risk? We are already aware that uh, Pakistan may like to improve its nuclear deterrence, but that has already been there on the charts for uh, 15 years. So what is the actual risk? Thank you. Thank you. I will take one more, sir. Uh, <coughs> my name is Sid from SAIS. Um, uh, I'm a student there. Uh, I wanted to uh, build on something quickly that Nilanti mentioned and then ask a question for uh, Mr. Nawaz and for Shane. Um, so Nilanti mentioned that uh, the Pakistan Navy is under-resourced but has a lot of international commitments. Uh, and I think similarly the Air Force, the Pakistan Air Force, has a lot of strengths that the Indian Air Force does not have, such as um, uh, systems that they can produce domestically, uh, like the JF-17, although with cooperation with China. So it seems like there's, uh, there's um, a qualitative advantage that the other services hold, but the budget seems to go towards the army. And this is kind of an organizational issue that the Pakistan military is dealing with. Uh, and we saw the similar thing is that there, uh, in Shane's numbers, uh, the artillery and main battle tanks that the Indian and Pakistani army, um, it's, uh, it, the, the, the divide isn't as great as the budget itself, which also points to uh, the same kind of organizational questions. So I wanted to ask uh, Mr. Nawaz, uh, how, is this, uh, um, how is this affected Pakistan's um, 
budget allocation uh, internally? And for Shane, uh, how does this translate into uh, effective strength in case of uh, competition if we're assuming that that competition exists with India? Thank you. So why don't we take the answers in reverse this time? So Shuja, if you mind starting and taking on some of the questions. Sure. Um, let me go back to what I said at the beginning, which was that um, the defense spending of Pakistan in, in the last decade plus has been distorted enormously by the internal uh, use of military. And, and that has been primarily the army, uh, except for recent action once they moved into South Waziristan and then North Waziristan, which involved the Air Force. Uh, there's been very little uh, use of combined uh, operations of the Air Force and the Army in Pakistan. Uh, the Navy um, has really not played a key role. And the joke has always been that you know, even in 65, the Navy heard about the war starting from Radio Pakistan's announcement. Uh, so uh, then, you know, I, I don't know how true that is, but you know, that, that was what the WAGs were, were saying. Uh, the Navy is critical in protecting Pakistan. Uh, Shores, that um, the Navy's expenditures will go up one when they acquire new weapon systems or new ships. Uh, and that uh, is not an easy task, particularly since Pakistan now doesn't have access to preferred financing uh, from suppliers. And I think that's going to be a very tough job for Pakistan. India, on the other hand, is now the world's largest importers of arms and arms systems. And so, therefore, it, it can name its price, and people are willing to break down its doors in order to sell in their stuff. So, within within the country, that because the army is in the forefront, particularly of the fight against uh, domestic terrorism and militancy, the army will continue to receive a greater number of, of forces. I don't know how easy it is to make the kind of comparison you're doing um, between uh, the air forces, say, of India and Pakistan. Um, India has obviously greater numbers, uh, and they are acquiring new weapons. Uh, but uh, Indian analyses show that their state of readiness is very poor. And uh, because Pakistan has a relatively smaller air force, clearly uh, they are forced into maintaining a much higher state of readiness. The difficulty has been in the helicopter forces, which the military needs, and the air force also, and in heavy lift capacity. Um, which they would need, particularly if they're fighting India, where they need to move troops from one sector to the other very rapidly because it's a huge border and Pakistan doesn't have the numbers to stop any Indian attack if one were to occur. I think that, that's an area where it might actually be counterintuitive, but it may be in the interest of major powers to strengthen Pakistan's ability as a defense mechanism, not to give it the offensive capacity, to be able to move troops so that it would give them much greater confidence in dealing with potential threat from India. This has never been addressed satisfactorily, in my view. Sure. Um, yeah, just in reference to what you just said about the Pakistan Navy and you know what, what, how, whether you know how true that story is, but I think even in India, there's that feeling about the Navy as not being as somehow important enough as a service. I mean, that's just you know a, essentially a land-centric uh, view of the the military, and I mean you could even stretch that out across militaries in Asia, where the army tends to dominate the. Uh, the militaries as, as a service. Um, but uh, of course, the Pakistan Navy is critical. Um, you, you just look at how much trade is, trans, uh, is, is shipped by sea, essentially, and the need to uh, protect the, the EEZs around each of these countries. And with regard to Pakistan Navy's contributions to combined maritime forces, um, I mean, that's that's a benefit not only just to Pakistan. I think, what is it, like 90% of uh, the, the trade, it's, it's maritime uh, based. Um, I mean, it's not only just a, a benefit for Pakistan, but just for the wider Western Indian Ocean region. Um, and right now, they're trying to seek uh, more frigates to maintain a certain operational tempo, uh, but it's been difficult. I know they've tried to reach out to the United States 
uh, as a traditional supporter of military assistance, but uh, to I think Congress has been kind of holding that up. Uh, in terms of uh, the ability to receive access defense articles. Um, but you, you can see in that case where, you know, we're talking like frigates, you know, it's, uh, and it's, uh, uh, it's a platform that has a, a real uh, regional benefit. So I, I think it is important to take into account the, the service specific needs uh, and not just view the Pakistan military as a whole and sort of the larger diplomatic uh, issues at stake. Okay, we still got a number of questions on Effect on military strength, the risks, and potential PMO slash fund. Sounds good. And uh, I think I'll, I'll take that in reverse order. Um, so, Sid, I, I, I think there is um, kind of an implicit argument that I make in the report that um, uh, maybe not so implicitly, explicitly, that uh, despite the uh, differential between defense spending in the two countries and the size of the two country, countries, that if you actually kind of think through conflict scenarios, likely conflict scenarios, that the military balance is uh, uh, much more even than one would expect. Um, Pakistan enjoys a shorter interior lines of communication, uh, uh, logistic and transportation times, um, and India, it's, it's the opposite. They have a, they've demonstrated a difficult time moving equipment to the border. India is trying to address this, but I think it remains to be seen. Um, so I think that's an important thing to know when we're thinking about the crisis and regional stability. Um, to the gentleman from uh, the embassy, I think that point taken on the uh, compete with India, I think we may agree, but just have a different definition of compete. Uh, I, I perhaps am using a more benign uh, definition of the term. Um, I see competition as just a regular form of uh, you know, interstate uh, relations. Um, I think Pakistan has national interests that it wishes to secure, and that in order to do that, um, it has to uh, focus on things like economic growth, national security, that kind of thing. Um, a point certainly taken on uh, the sacrifices that uh, Pakistan has made, especially uh, civilians um, and the military. I think that's a point that it's, uh, could, should be acknowledged more in the United States. Um, I think there has been and will continue to be a, a tension about um, Pakistan's uh, stated objective to pursue uh, all uh, militant groups in Pakistan. Um, I think that's probably that debate's probably not likely to go away. But the point about uh, the personal sacrifice in Pakistan is, is well taken. I think but when I think of risks, um, particularly in Pakistan's case, I, I kind of think of it uh, in, in, um, in, in this way, um, that uh, Pakistan has a, a, a deterrent against India. It has a strategic deterrent. Um, it has invested a lot uh, in this capability. So from my perspective, if you have a finite number of resources to invest, um, it seems like investments in nuclear capabilities uh, are of uh, a smaller marginal utility uh, than conventional capabilities. Um, uh, from my perspective, at least, that uh, Pakistan has chain, uh, obtained its strategic deterrent objectives. But I think for every new uh, short-range ballistic missile, uh, and for presumably every new uh, submarine or surface ship that has nuclear weapons, I think it gets less and less deterrent value. Uh, so if I were in Pakistan's position, um, I, I would tend to, I, I think I would think like that. I would, I would hope to, to make calculations based on that. And the risks are that if Pakistan invests resources in nuclear capabilities at the expense of conventional capabilities and counterterrorism, counterinsurgency capabilities, um, that uh, those capabilities will deteriorate and that consequently Pakistan will be less safe. And I think to Daniel's point, that's an excellent question. Um, and I think uh, 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 to uh, concisely answer your question, um, I, I, what I consider to be other costs in addition to DRDO uh, would obviously be fiscal material production costs, things like the Department of, Ener the Dep Department of Atomic Energy. Um, uh, the space program probably has a factor uh, in this as well. Um, the trouble is, as you know, that there's not a whole lot of fidelity that we have on, on those types of figures. Uh, in addition, we, uh, India has a separation of civilian and civilian nuclear program and its military nuclear program. <clears throat> I know that there's some debate about if there is any overlap between the two and how exactly do you tease out those costs. I think that's, uh, that's worthy of a whole other report. Um, and uh, the, the um, off-budget financing, uh, certainly given India's uh, history and the fact that it was under sanctions, uh, for so many years with respect to its nuclear program. I wouldn't be surprised that um, 
some of the practices that it used uh, continues today. Again, I have there's no transparency on this, so I can't know for sure, but it's something uh, worthy of uh, scrutiny, uh, definitely. So, I mean, could I just yep. add, uh, I think on the nuclear side, there may be an opportunity also, uh, rather than just a risk, uh, for both India and Pakistan. Uh, both countries have in their inventory uh, a lot of outmoded delivery vehicles, as well as weapons that were produced many years ago. Uh, and it would certainly help their own dialogue on nuclear issues uh, if uh, out of the, uh, uh, the glare of publicity, they could get together and agree on uh, decommissioning some of these weapons systems and delivery systems, which in fact may have inherent dangers in simply having on, uh, on the inventory. Um, and this would be a very good way of signaling a shift into achieving some kind of rationality in the dialogue. Uh, the fact that they every year routinely exchange a list of all their nuclear installations is a good thing. And this is simply would kind of build on that relationship between them, where they could, Pakistan could say, well, we're take decommissioning and retiring X number of old missiles and X number of, uh, of weapon systems, and India could reciprocate. But all this really is contingent upon the political will, which unfortunately, I think in, in the last few months particularly, has gone so far south mm -hmm. that I don't know uh, if that spiral is going to be able to be brought under control. Yeah. That's a great point. So we, why don't we take a last round of questions, and uh, we can try to wrap up on time. So Master Rafel. Uh, yes, Robin Rifle. Um, sorry, a general question. I haven't read the report, so I don't know if this is, is mentioned or not. But it's widely perceived that Pakistan spends a disproportionate amount of its budget and GNP on defense, um, and particularly on nuclear, um, and whether vis-a-vis -vis India or, or any other country in its state of development. Can you make any kind of general comment in that regard? Um, is it, you know, I, I don't know whether you've been, had the opportunity to compare beyond India, but I mean, is it really disproportionate? Is it in the middle? Does it make sense vis-a-vis -vis the kinds of threats that they face? Um, any kind of general comment I'd appreciate. Thank you. Good question, Dr. Thank you. I'm Bilal Hayyam, also from the Embassy of Pakistan. I just wanted to uh, ask a question. A comment was made by Shuja Nawaz that, uh, uh, unlike Pakistan, um, India has been using its law enforcement authorities to uh, deal with its insurgencies. Uh, I think that is true to a large extent. Uh, but my question is that uh, when we look at the situation in Kashmir, uh, we know that uh, this is probably the uh, most uh, uh, densely militarized zone on Earth today, and India is probably has deployed one third of its army there. So, what, what, in your view, is the reason that, uh, unlike its, you know, posturing to deal with other insurgencies, India has to deploy that much uh, force in Kashmir? And as you rightly also mentioned, that Pakistan's uh, nuclear uh, threat and also the military drug crime, whatever it is, is basically India-centric. What, in your view, uh, is uh, this situation that uh, uh, if the situation, if the, the dispute of Kashmir is resolved, it will uh, have positive result and positive contribution towards uh, reducing the military spending at least as far as Pakistan is concerned. Thank you. Can we take one more? Oh, I'll just wait for the mic real quick, sorry. Hi, Patrick Bratton, Army War College. Uh, I have two quick questions. Uh, one of the ones was on the pensions in India. I mean, just given how politicized one rank went pension and the officer shortfall in the Indian Army, I mean, this problem's not going to go away. It seems it's only going to get worse. Are there alternatives for India? And then second, already mentioned was given the investment in paramilitary forces and other police and security forces in India. Has this had a negative impact on the military budget? And so 
in sort of an ideal world, if internal security went down in India, would we also maybe in the future see an increase in the military budget if you would have less need for the police? Thank you. Okay. So um, why don't we start with Nalanti first? You have uh, always been uh, second in this opportunity. So why don't you uh, go uh, ahead? Well, thank you. Uh, I, I think most of the questions were uh, directed to Shuja, but uh, I just wanted to pick up on what the Pakistani uh, air attaché mentioned about uh, how the goal is, it, it, there's no desire to compete with India. The goal is actually credible deterrence. So it, it just made me think of what exactly are the objectives that we're talking about? Is it really nuclear capability, nuclear deterrence, or is it uh, more about, I think Shuja used the word confidence. Is it about, it, it seems to me like it's more about getting to that level of, of confidence and that there is this credible deterrence. So it just, um, I mean, if, if the confidence is really the, the goal, uh, just, to, just to think a little creatively about what solutions uh, could be pursued uh, to get there, and those kinds of confidence building measures that uh, Shuja mentioned. Um, yeah, so uh, that, that just struck me that I think Shuja gets the most of the questions. Just, just on that point, I think um, in terms of conventional deterrence, um, even under the previous army chief, General Kiani, the conventional forces had been moved in Pakistan in a manner that uh, the Pakistan army was quite convinced that despite any in Indian buildup close to the border, that anything even resembling Gold Start or Duke Warm Start or whatever would, would be handled. Uh, this was by moving the armored corps there from Karia to Kujarwala, uh, to, to that core. Because both countries know the terrain well. It was a bit like NATO and, and Warsaw Pact countries, every square inch is well known. And you knew where they were going to come and you knew what you were going to do. So it's just the element of surprise. Uh, but the, it's, the deterrence gives you that confidence that should there be a breakthrough that you, you would have, and this has been the Pakistani rationale for developing the so-called technical weapons, shocking weapons. Afghanistan is now complicated, the calculus, because as, as India and Afghanistan uh, become closer friends, then Pakistan sees that as uh, an extension of a potential Indian coercive move against Pakistan. Uh, so there may not be the competition that the air attaché um, referred to, but there is always this perceived uh, threat of, of potential coercive uh, power being used to force Pakistan into doing things or accepting things that Pakistan uh, will find unpalatable on other fronts, not just on the military front. Uh, on the question from uh, to Bilal from the embassy, I, I think you may not have heard my full sentence. I said the Indian um, paramilitary forces are the front line, except in Kashmir, where there is a huge military presence. So uh, I think one should recognize that Kashmir is a very special case. Now, uh, I think resolving the Kashmir issue uh, will certainly go a long way, but so long as you have uh, the order of battle that we see today uh, of the forces uh, on both sides that are virtually eyeball to eyeball, uh, there's always going to be room for, for error and <coughs> accident and so on. And I think it, 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 so long as the borders remain closed, which they are relatively close. There's no movement, there's not much trade. Um, you're going to always have this tension between the two countries. And uh, as I mentioned, Afghanistan now is complicating the equation from the Pakistani point of view. And we're going to have to wait to see how that plays out in the next two to four years. I'll just add on, on the Kashmir point that, I mean, saturation is a strategy that India has used in a lot of campaigns, including in Punjab, where they deployed six divisions and another six divisions of paramilitary on top of a police force for border security. So it seems to be, at least in sort of that region, uh, how they operate for counterinsurgency. Um, Jim, we've got a few questions left on pensions, on uh, uh, disproportionate defense spending. And, uh, I'll, I'll start with uh, yeah. the ambassador's question on uh, <coughs> disproportionate or perceived disproportionate defense spending. Um, I, I think that uh, perception does need to be tempered a little bit and based on uh, the documents that I went through, um, that it's certainly nothing like, uh, you know, 
40, 50 percent of federal spending or anything like that. I think if you go and look back in the data, it was uh, the defense burden was much, much higher in the 80s, for example, and has been slowly decreasing ever since. Um, <clears throat> but nevertheless, I would, uh, I would add two points. One, that uh, because uh, defense budgets are relatively opaque in Pakistan, that there is some grain of salt that you have to take when nailing down uh, an estimate on defense spending, and that factors into the defense burden as well. So it, it could, it's, uh, my estimate is around 18% of the federal spending, but it could be uh, somewhere north of that. And then uh, perhaps uh, the last thing on this is that um, I think um, the question, uh, the, the right question might be, uh, is the defense burden uh, a proportionate defense burden for a country that faces a lot of the challenges that Pakistan faces uh, in terms of poverty, in terms of public health and education, and all these types of factors? And that's certainly a question that uh, the Pakistani government uh, gets to decide. Um, I, I would say to the gentleman's question from the Army War College on the pensions and alternative to one rank one pension, um, I, in the last week or so, I feel like there have been reports coming out of the Ministry of Defense about uh, kind of uh, walking this back or making some adjustments, which has produced uh, you know a vehement response. Um, and as you can imagine, uh, the politics of uh, you know uh, veterans uh, affairs is really it's really bad. You know you don't want to go there. Um, so the last thing any political party wants is to be seen as shortchanging veterans. So I think uh, there probably are alternatives, um, but uh, it seems like the the space for a, a hyper rational assessment of uh, of uh, fiscal policy and these types of things is really narrowing in India, uh, particularly in light of developments with. Uh, the URI attack and the media and all, all these types of things. And I think, um, probably Samir, not to put this on you, but I think as far as paramilitary budgets in India, um, I think you'd probably have more insight to that than I would. Not necessarily the budgets, but the role of the paramilitaries um, in defense. And I think one thing I, I, I think um, could add to this report is defining uh, defense more broadly and defining defense to include uh, paramilitary forces in Pakistan to include uh, the border security force in India. Um, I think that would give a more holistic sense of, of defense spending. Um, but I suppose that's for the, for the seat. Can we just add one more point uh, for, for the audience? Yes. Uh, a report that Mom Guruswami and I did on looking at the opportunity cost of conflict between India and Pakistan. That was in response to a request from Secretary Schultz who thought that this, this is worth looking at, the economics of it. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and our bottom line was that it roughly cost both countries about uh, one percentage point of GDP growth annually. Um, and that if there was some way for them to take a deep breath and, uh, and calm things down, that, that that money would then be available for other purposes. This was in the, 80, in the 1980s? No, this is now. Oh, recently? Okay. Yeah. Oh, wow. The report came out about uh, two years ago. Oh, wow. Okay. And it's, it's on the web. It's called The Opportunity Cost of Conflict mm -hmm. Between India and Pakistan. Right. Mon Guruswami and I did that together. Response to a request from Secretary Schultz, he wrote the forward to it, so it has his uh, signature. Well, with that, I think we should, uh, it's time to wrap up. I apologize, I've left you five, taking five minutes over, um, but this is the South Asia program, so I think you understand. <laughs> uh, I want to thank you all for joining us. Thank you, uh, Nilanti and Shuja, for your comments, um, and Shane for a fantastic one.